how much you owe. Yeah. yeah. And written note. Sure. Or physically. Oh, hi. Energy, energy, energy. That creates the lid. Everybody so if you and I disagree on something, then you must be erased and banished from life. So how does I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna sit here and drink this water. Hi guys, welcome back to Sam Speaks. Thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Today we are interviewing author, realtor, mom, wife, runner, superwoman. Did I miss anything? Political activist. There you go, Miss Lee Brown. Thanks for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure to be invited. Okay, so I have so many questions to ask you, but what really is interesting to me, as a first question anyway, is your book. How did you come up with that? Why, why, what inspired you to write a book? What, what's kind of your motivation behind that? And, and how are you using that in your real estate career? Hmm, that's a lot of questions in one. So the main reason I wrote my book is because I am very frustrated by American society. Mm -hmm. So it's beyond realtorhood. I see that everything we do as realtors has a profound effect on the fabric of society. And in our society right now, we are incredibly divided. So if you and I disagree on something, then you must be erased and banished from life and removed, period. There is no discussion. I hate that about our society. Mm -hmm. And so in my book, I talked about the fact that we need to be able to disagree yet still have opinions and get along with each other. So you don't have to be a jack leg when you disagree with somebody. Sure. And I see this manifest itself in realtor society where realtors are so busy trying to be all things to all people that nobody has an opinion because I might offend this person and I might offend this person. And as a result, they show six houses and say, this one's great, this one's great, this one's great, this one's great, this one's great. And they sound like a broken record because they're so afraid to say, uh, uh, this one might not be your best choice. Now, right. y'all want to buy it, that's cool, but we're going to have to discuss the issues. And realtors have to have opinions. Mm -hmm. We, as human beings, have to have opinions, but most importantly, we have to learn how to be authentic without being assholes. And so my concept of outrageous authenticity is talking about regaining the who of what you are, the fabric of what you are, without being an asshole. And at the end of the book, my biggest moment was trying to get people to understand that this idea of authenticity should not be outrageous. Sure. However, in today's world, it's gotten to be that way. So when I give political opinions, I get a lot of people giving me feedback. That's cool. I welcome your feedback, but I'm not going to stop having an opinion just because you don't agree with it. Sure. So obviously you're very outspoken, which is awesome, and I respect that completely, and I appreciate that because there's a lot of people that think of things, but they're afraid to speak their minds whether it's in real estate or anything else for that matter. How though has that hurt you? Because with being out, when you're outspoken and when you do speak your mind, you also have criticism and you have people that don't like what you have to say, which you also have to respect because not everyone's going to agree with you. So let's talk about criticism. How do you, how do you not necessarily avoid it, but how do you counter that? You don't have to avoid it. And as a woman, and especially as a Southern woman, I'm trained to please people. That's just how my people operate. Mm -hmm. But there comes a point in your life, and maybe it's because I'm medium aged now, I don't really care You're still very what young. somebody else thinks. Yes, but nobody knows. My <laughs> colorist knows. She's the only one. But there's a, there's a point that comes where you have to say, look, what I am and what I believe is more important than this random person's opinion. Mm -hmm. You have to let go of what other people think about you in order to move forward. And the people who are concerned and consumed with what other people say, you're not going to be able to, to grow and change the world. And frankly, I'd rather have a few haters so that I can change the world for the rest that are not haters. Sure. And it's, it's just going to happen. And so the only thing I would say that's been painful about being an outspoken person is when I am personally attacked or when sure. my husband is attacked or when my children are attacked because in our world right now i blame social media for this mm -hmm. social media is hateful mm -hmm. it was intended as a way for people to connect but now it's become a a machine for people to hide behind and say things you never say to somebody else's face right and it's just shameful to me to the point where a man actually made a comment on a blog post that had picked up one of my videos a couple weeks ago and said must be awful to be married to her. Well, my husband monitors comments, and he said, thanks for your concern, it's not so bad. 
And I said, yay, good job, honey. <laughs> and then this dude replied back. He's like, whoa, the husband answered. I wasn't trying to be mean, man. And he was totally backtracking. Right. Because he thought he was safe to be a troll. And then he got busted for it. And so Steve was like, maybe I fixed one troll. Hey, that's a big win for the world. But the biggest thing I can say, if you're looking at the idea of criticism, learn how to take it. Right. We haven't trained this whole young generation your people, you millennials, y'all mm-hmm. are y'all are cute and don't have gray hair yet, and oh, trust me, things I do. are still good. But <laughs> this generation has been so coddled; they don't know how to take criticism. And that old adage of "sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me." And we know words hurt, but we haven't trained and taught people to say, "I'm going to build up a defense mechanism to manage hurtful words." Instead, we're trying to make people not be hurtful. The human nature is that you can hurt somebody sometime. Deal with it. Sure. Couldn't agree more. So you're a very passionate person. What? Why did you decide to get into real estate? I mean, what, what kind of drove you into that business? It's kind of out of options because after I graduated from Carolina, I was a bar manager because I didn't know what to do with myself. And then one of my regulars hired me to be a stockbroker because, you know, stockbrokers really do drink. They drink more than realtors do. So I went to be a stockbroker, and I did not like living in Manhattan for one thing. And for another thing, I hated, hated managing people's money because I saw a different side of humanity than I ever want to see again. Mm -hmm. And after that, I went to sell chainsaws. And I was the only woman on the sales force selling chainsaws. And then they were going to move me every year. And I didn't want to move every year because I did want to get married and have kids. And you can't do that if you're driving 5,000 miles a month, which is what I was clicking on my odometer. And so I said, well, I'm 25 and I've been through three industries. Uh, I'll come back home and join my daddy in real estate because he'd been in since 1978, Mm -hmm. had wanted me to join him and... I said, all right, I may as well try that. And 16 years later, here I am. What did you love most about real estate? I love that it changes every day. And I love that at 16 years, I've got still several different career paths I can create from one industry. And I don't know that there's any other career option that is so ripe with entrepreneurism that you can do selling of houses, you can do owning a brokerage, you can do political advocacy, you can be a coach, you can be a speaker, you can be a vendor, you can create a product, create a market. There's a zillion things you can do with it. Mm -hmm. I love that about this industry. You've obviously, you've grown a brand, you've grown a really strong brand. Your name, when people hear your name, they know that they're going to hear someone great when it, you know, when you're speaking and you have a great following. I think a lot of people kind of try to figure out, well, what's more important, growing the brand or just doing deals when it comes to real estate? (laughs) So what do you have to say about that? The agents who are concerned about deal after deal after deal are the ones that screw up the industry. And you can argue with me all you want about that. I'm right. The ones who are doing this house, and then I'm going to go to this house, and then I'm going to go to this house, they're not concerned with the consumer of this house and how their relationship in the real estate transaction affects the consumer on both sides of the coin Mm -hmm. because they're looking at the transaction. When you look at the transaction, you're actually driven by money. Mm -hmm. So whether you're selling two houses a year or a thousand houses a year, if you are transaction focused, at the end of the day, you're about the money. Sure. I was raised not to be about the money. In fact, my dad told me when I got in, if you do people right, the money will find you. Mm -hmm. It just happens that way. And so if you're a transaction-based broker and you are hung up in this deal, if it crashes, your world comes crashing down around you. You also are missing the nuances of how this one transaction has ripple effects inside the neighborhood that it sits in, inside the overall local community, in the state, in the nation, in the industry. And so your realtors who get it Mm -hmm. are the ones who are looking at real estate from a 30,000 foot view and they're able to laser beam in on that consumer and say, I get it. This is your largest financial instrument. I'm going to advise you as to what's best for you, regardless of how it affects me. Mm -hmm. Those are your best realtors. And you'll find this as you talk to the producers who are getting it, when they pull themselves outside of the transaction-based business and look at it as an actual business and look at it as an industry and look at this as a really big picture, 
they get what they did wrong. I was doing it wrong for the first several years of my business. I was focused on volume, sell more houses, sell more houses, make more money, and my business was exploding. The crazy part is when I pulled myself out of a transaction-based business and turned into a better human being who is more engaged in the industry and in the community, my business has grown exponentially since then. Mm -hmm. Because as it turns out, the consumer prefers a realtor who is engaged in the local community right. and not just bullshitting people by saying, oh, I'm going to come to your neighborhood cookout and be the realtor who hands out business cards and woohoo. Right. But the realtor who's at the town hall meeting to ask about eminent domain, the realtor who's at the PTA meeting asking about school reassignments, that's where you see realtors changing communities. And it's not just one house that can do that. But mm -hmm. you as a realtor, you touch all these different consumers. You're touching these neighborhoods. You're involved in all the angles of the transaction. You can transform the place where you live. I mean, how else do we get that opportunity? So let's talk about coaching. Where did you initially get trained? What advice could you give an agent out there who's a newbie agent, doesn't know anything, and they're looking to get some good advice, some good training, some good coaching? Well, I think, first of all, anybody who gets their license and wants to get coaching ought to be asking all of these little coaching companies, when's the last time you actually bought or sold a house and helped somebody? Mm -hmm. Because in our industry, it's really easy to make money off realtors because realtors will spend money and, oh, I can get 100 listings if I do that. All right, here. Oh, there's a new gadget. I want to buy it. And they right. spend money without regard for the return on investment. Mm -hmm. And so a new agent, ask lots of questions. Why are you a coach? What's your background? How long have you had an active license? When's the last time you helped a consumer? And if they tell you that the foundations of real estate never change, then be very afraid of that person because they're about to give you all their techniques from 1978, a lot of which do actually still work. However, the consumer is shifting. The consumer has shifted in the 16 years I've been in the business, and a good coach is still enough in the trenches to understand what consumers are saying and what they need. Mm -hmm. So that's the first piece of advice I give. Now, you can shortcut your success cycle by hiring a coach. Absolutely you can, because this isn't a new thing, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. You do need to find a broker who will answer your questions and answer your phone call, because mm -hmm. there are some great brokers in this country, and there are some really awful ones. To me, where the rubber hits the road is when the broker is available and communicative and is willing to walk you through how to survive whatever wildfire you have created through your own incompetence. Because if you're a new licensee, you're incompetent. We know that. You have to acknowledge it too. Mm -hmm. Because as realtors, we have so much ego. We all act like we know everything from the minute we get our license. You don't know anything. Most of us, we go think back they watch to watch it on TV and they think they know everything. That's a whole different <laughs> ballgame because that's all edited. Yeah. So find the broker who will answer your questions and then find the coaching place or just get out into the industry. Maybe you can't afford coaching at a thousand bucks a month. That makes sense. So go to conferences, go to your local association and go to every educational class they offer. Mm -hmm. I don't care how boring and terrible it sounds. Go to all of them. Go to your state association. Go to all those educational sessions. Go to the National Association of Realtors annual conference. We have 25,000 realtors there in November out of a million. But the 25,000 that are there are crazy actively engaged and you will grow at leaps and bounds past your competition because you're reaching outside your local market, you're reaching outside your brokerage, outside your brand. Mm -hmm. Because none of the brands or the brokers are the single clearing house for the best information. They've all got good stuff, but I've learned the most from being outside my local market and outside my brand. So when I first got in the business, my dad didn't let me touch a consumer for 90 days. I had to live in his hip pocket before he would let me touch a consumer. It's the most brilliant thing he could have done. And I had to go on listing appointments and buyer appointments, and I had to do everything with him so that I would not harm the consumer when they were turned loose with me. Mm -hmm. And as realtors, we have to do a better job of not harming consumers instead of looking at consumers as an opportunity for training, which is how the industry currently looks at them. Mm -hmm. So he sent me to Howard Brenton, which Howard's now passed away, but he was the best trainer we had in the industry, bar none. And he died of cancer a few years ago, but the program that he had built through the early 90s into the mid-2000s was called Star Power. Star Power was a network of amazing realtors 
from all markets, all different average price points all over the country who would share everything they did about their businesses. So Howard did a monthly series of interviews to say, how did you get your business here? And these people would tell you everything they did. Mm -hmm. I mean, they weren't holding it back. They weren't sugarcoating it. They shared completely transparent how they went from zero to 300 transactions or 800 transactions or whatever they were doing. And so when we lost Howard, we lost that beautiful network of sharing. And there's lots of people that have tried to fill the void and it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. But all I can tell you is that if you're a new agent, you can find somebody retiring who has any of the star power materials, any of the old cassette tapes and CDs, because I've got them all and you couldn't buy them from me for any price. Get them because those are the most powerful training I could have received in the industry. And it also gave me somebody to look up to. Right. Because when I got in and I'm meeting these stars, I'm completely starstruck. I'm like, ah, oh my gosh, that's Alexis Bolin. And Alexis is a realtor in Pensacola, Florida, who is in her 70s now and very active in the business. I've never met a more sharing person than Alexis, and she's the queen of scripts and dialogues. Her knowledge is amazing. So I got to meet her, I'm a young realtor, and I'm like, wow, she's awesome. And the cool thing was, she didn't act like I was some newbie. She wasn't patting me on the head and making me go away. She's wanting to know how she can help me. Right. And so as I have grown in the industry, I take on the Alexis's of the world, Leslie McDonald from the Chicago area, Brian Bamba from the Chicago area. I mean, all these people in different places who have shared with me, that's my role models. I want to do like them. So I give back. So if you're newer in the industry, you've got to look ahead too to where you're going to affect the industry after you kind of get the mechanics of buying and selling under your belt. What are you going to do to make the industry better when you leave it? Right. Scripts. Do you love them or leave them? I <laughs> love scripts. Any agent who says they don't use scripts is full of shit. They all use them. How do you assume, though, this is always my question with scripts. Scripts are very, you know, it's a, it's a script, so it's very direct. And you can't, uh, you can't know how someone's going to respond. Just like when you post something on social, you don't know that, you know, you know that people are going to love you. You know that people aren't going to love you. And they're going to say their opinion, whether it's right or wrong. With scripts, you're prepared, but you're only prepared to an extent. So how do you feel about that? Well, you have to have some preparation. And the beauty of scripts is not that you will have every answer to every situation because in real estate, you've never seen it all. There's mm -hmm. always something new that's coming, but it gives you something to say to the consumer, if for nothing else, and to buy time before you say, you know what, I'm gonna have to call somebody for some advice on this. But the consumer doesn't feel like you're completely hopeless and clueless. Right. And when you start doing this long enough, there are certain things you're going to hear over and over. I don't want to get pre-approved before I look at this house. Or I don't like this carpet. Or we can't afford this house. There's lots of things you hear said over and over. And what the consumer has said is not necessarily what's going on, mm -hmm. but your opportunity to go deeper and find out what's happening is what scripts do for you. So if you tell me you don't like the carpet in a house, I have a script for that. My script is, well, if this wasn't here, would you buy the house? Well, what do you mean? What do y'all want here? We want hardwoods. If the seller gave you hardwoods, would you buy the house? And that doesn't even sound scripted. You're not having to sound like a used car salesman or an insurance salesman or one of those people who call us realtors and try to sell us Google page one, which drives me crazy. <laughs> but the people who are living by a script are one group, but the ones who use the script as a way to draw information out of the consumer, that's who I am and that's what I promote. Mm -hmm. Because you have to know what to say. Sure. How has, how has selling chainsaws helped you in real estate? Oh, I don't know that it's necessarily helped me in real estate, but well, I've sales sold are a, sales. You're yeah, selling. I mean, it's got to be something. I don't see, and I don't believe sales are sales. Uh, in our business, we are charged with handling what is for most consumers our largest financial instrument. Mm -hmm. And we have an intimate place in their lives. They tell us things that they haven't told their mama and mm -hmm. they often haven't told their spouse or don't tell their best friend. So we're in this place of confidant and counselor as well as person who's handling their largest financial instrument. So I don't look at what we do as sales in the standpoint of when I was selling chainsaws, where it was, hey, here's this model. Here's why it's great. Here's this model. Here's why it's great. Or buy a pallet of both. Hey, we can sell them. That's totally different than right. where are these children going to lay their head down at night? Mm -hmm. So the products are different. So the approach is different. Mm -hmm. What I got out of chainsaw sales is an amazing amount of confidence because 
I mean, I was the only woman some of these people had probably seen in 25 years, and so they didn't know what to do with me anyway except sign my orders. That was fine. And I had an incredible amount of confidence because living by myself in other states, I ate out by myself all the time. I was driving across the state, living in hotel rooms. So you learn to strike up a conversation with a stranger that's completely natural and not, hey, who do you know that needs to buy or sell a house? So I learned right. some of those kind of skills. The people skills. It helps with that and confidence level. Which but is great. I've sold more houses to people that I used to work with than I ever made working there. So there's been that benefit. So I've been able to, that database knew me, trusted me, and allowed me to represent them in real estate. And so... It was the relationship that mattered, not the skill set, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. There's a lot of people that work within the family. So you worked with your father, which is great. I know my, my father wasn't in real estate, but my dad was an attorney. And I swear, ever since I was born, I had to work for him. Like He's like, oh, yep. you're born. That's why they had us. Yep. <laughs> you're going to work. Here's a computer. Figure it out. Um, so like you, I, I get that. It was that whole, you got to work hard if you want things to happen. Um, but as you know, working with family can definitely get tricky um, and emotions are there and because it is family it can be tough. So how do you think, how did that dynamic work? Because you weren't just shadowing for, you know, forever, obviously. So how did you, what were the ups and downs of working in family? I wouldn't trade that experience for anything else I've ever had in my life to have had all those days with my dad. And I still have him, so I talk about him like he's dead, even though he's retired. But I wouldn't trade any of my working days with my dad for anything because mm -hmm. it gave me an opportunity to know my whole dad. And I, there's, a, there's an opportunity that you have in life to know people on more than one level which is another reason I kind of hate social media because we start surface painting people and you don't dig deeper to know all their layers. Right. But I was around a man who'd been in the business for this long and he's approaching his 40th year who had only one enemy in the whole Charlotte market. And I don't know of any realtor with that few enemies, mm -hmm. just one. And frankly, it's her fault that she hates him because she was wrong, but people love my dad and there's the only downside of working with him was that we didn't ever stop talking real estate and we've stopped it now that he's retired he asks how he can help he is my biggest cheerleader and he and my mom support everything that i'm doing in the industry as much as they possibly can um, they're amazing grandparents and so part of his why for retiring when he did because he's still young enough he could be selling mm -hmm. But this weekend, he was in the mountains with my kids fishing. And you can't do that in the summer when you're a realtor if you right. are hardcore after it. So I, there's, that's the only downside is we talked real estate too much. There's, you we, still look at him as a coach, as a mentor? Um, he's, my, he's my sounding board. I don't know if I would necessarily call him a, a coach at this point, but... Mm -hmm. He's my sounding board. So I guess it depends on how you define that coaching piece. And he's actually started coaching agents on the side because he loves mentoring and helping people from a holistic standpoint. So he loves on people as much as he guides them through real estate. And since I offer some coaching, but it's not my wheelhouse, mm -hmm. that's been really great. So he can handle the people who need somebody and I don't have enough bandwidth for it. But um, I mean, my dad's forgotten more than most realtors will ever know. Mm -hmm. He still serves at the local association. He serves on the grievance committee, which is so interesting to me because he spent most of his career not involved in association life till I pushed him into it because he was in business mode, not in advocacy and volunteerism mode because many realtors see them as two different inner um, non-connected spheres. And my dad does grievance now because most realtors file a grievance on each other when they're mad. Yep. And they not going to cool off. I'm, I'm going to take them down, take their license. I hate them. So my dad goes in there from the standpoint of, let's, let's get the whole story. He loves people. He believes they really didn't mean to do anything wrong. He's the one on grievance that is going to give them a fair chance when the rest of the committee's like, mm -hmm. punish them. Put them at the stake. Set them on fire. <laughs> Daddy's not going to set them on fire. He wants to hear them out first. Yeah. So, because you get a lot of just, if people beautiful. are so quick to hate than to say something positive. Mm -hmm. So I highly doubt there's ever any, 
oh, this agent's great. They were great to work with. They should win an award. I highly doubt that your dad has ever seen that. He, he just, he loves people so much. He believes the best in them. And when I joined him in the business, I mean, people were trying to screw him because mm -hmm. he's just believing in the good in all people. Mm -hmm. And part of my job and coming in was, nah, nah, daddy, nah, this is not a good person over here. No, no, they're, they're not doing you right. Because I do, um, I, I'm a little bit more cynical, a little bit more of a realist than mm -hmm. my dad, who is the lover of all people. So you take him to any real estate event, it's Daryl, 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 <laughs> and everybody hugs him and loves him. You don't want to happen to me that you? much. Yeah, not so much. They're like, oh, I saw your video. <laughs> they don't really know what to do with me because I don't fit any mold, but that's all right because my dad fits that love. Well, it's interesting, though, because you say that social media is kind of a tricky place, but you do use your social and you have a good following on social. So how has social media helped you and which platform do you like the best? Social media has helped me tremendously because I'm an introvert, which nobody ever believes because I am very comfortable on a stage in front of a thousand people. But if you put me in front of 10 people, I don't like that very much. It's mm -hmm. too intimate for me. So social media has, for a couple of things has allowed me to reach people without having to sit down and spend four hours with them because that, just, that drains me. It's right. just how I'm wired. And the other, other thing was I'm, I sell a lot of houses. And that means in any particular marketplace, when you are a top producer, your local competitors just by nature are going to have to hate you. Just, just how it has to be. You're not really loved till you get 50 miles outside your market. And I was already selling a bunch of houses when Facebook came along. And I was on active rain when it got started. So that would have been 06. Mm -hmm. And it's 10 years now since realtors have really started to coalesce on the internet. And in 06, my business was taken up like this. And my competitors hated me because I'm very to the point with business. You call me, here's your answer, boom, here's your answer, boom. I'm not going to chit chat for 45 minutes because mm -hmm. it's not who I am. Well, they stopped hating me as much because of social media because they could see that I had babies. Because in 06, I had a newborn and I had a one and a half year old. And then they're watching my kids grow. They're seeing me with my parents. They're seeing me in my life. And they stopped hating me for selling houses and saying, oh, Lee's a person. And so there's a piece of humanity that social media gives to us. And I think we have to be careful not to lose it now because it's moved from, oh my gosh, we went to school together, yay! Which is how it was at the beginning to, all right, who do we have in common? Mm -hmm. What kind of people are you friends with? What kind of political things did you click like on? Are you Trump or are you Clinton? Who are you? What mm -hmm. kind of person? And judging them before we take the time to get to know them by what they're posting. So Facebook is my favorite platform, and I've described it before, and I wish I knew where I read this all those years ago, but Facebook is a dinner party. Mm -hmm. And so you're at a table with people you already know having conversation. And realtors really screw themselves on Facebook when they post open houses and virtual tours and, oh, I've had eight closings this month. I'm so blessed. Or, oh, I'm just exhausted from showing houses or houses are flying off the shelves. And nobody wants to hear that. You wouldn't sit down at supper and say that. Facebook has um, given me a way to now, and, and let me back that up, because my... My first time on Facebook, and, I, and it's kind of embarrassing to look at on this day because you can yep, see how your Facebook <laughs> life has changed and how you've learned what to say and what not to say as the platform has grown. Mm -hmm. But it's a way for me to reach people that I don't get an opportunity to reach otherwise. Mm -hmm. And as my place in the industry has shifted over the last few years from being a producer to being a volunteer, and now, I mean... People watch what I say, and I'm under a microscope that I, I created by accident. I didn't really wind up doing what I'm doing on purpose, honestly. But they're watching what I say, and they're watching what I do. So I'm trying my best to be a proponent of professionalism in the industry and tell agents how to do the business better. And here's what to say and what not to say. And I'm trying to be – I'm trying to do right mm -hmm. – um, I don't want to say I'm trying to be a role model because that sounds really heavy handed, but I want to give people something they can share on their wall when they don't want to talk real estate that relates to what's happening in their business and helps them either feel affirmed or gives them a chance to say, oh, I can probably do better. And so, for example, realtors like to talk shit about each other on social networks, even if they're trying to disguise it. Well, I don't want to know that. <laughs> the picture thing is what kills me the most. 
<laughs> oh, I saw this awful picture in MLS on this other person's listing. What consumer would hire this agent? And they do it all the time. And it's not identifiable. The person's name isn't on there. There's no property address. Mm -hmm. But they're basically saying, I'm good, but the rest of y'all suck. Right. But that's not really positive for the industry. So every time I see a realtor do that, my comment back is, did you place a gentle phone call to that realtor and ask them if they know this photo's online? Because they might not know. If they manually uploaded 24 photos to MLS and accidentally clicked on the one that was the repair of the rotted wood at the door jam that they were going to remind the seller about, why are we not saying to each other, hey, did you know you posted this? And if the other agent's like, yes, I did, and I love my photo, it's like, all right, Jesus be with you. I've done what I can, but I want us as realtors to do each other better before we talk about it online. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I, I definitely understand where that's coming from. I mean, I I try not to read through the news feed because, like you said, everyone's trying to, you know, post all their stuff. And I did eight closing and this. And you don't really know. And you don't have time to fact check. And you don't even want to fact check. I mean, who cares? I do. I, I do check my posts. <laughs> check them all. Bring me an offer. I'm going to look at your production before I call you back. I post, you know, what I think is interesting or my listings and some pictures because obviously I have to promote it. And then I get off. And then I continue on with my day. But I will say, you know, when I do see someone who has that multi-million dollar listing and they take a picture with their iPhone and the bathroom or whatever has a mirror and you see the agent in the mirror and you're like, how did they get that listing? This is driving me nuts. I would never post something like that. But like you said, I would give them a call because sometimes I want to have a progressive open and I want to have pictures of everyone's listing and I don't want to put something out where I have amazing professional right. pictures that I spent a whole lot of money on and then have their picture, you know, with the reflection in the mirror or their iPhone shots. So I do think it's important to, again, something that when I've interviewed other people, it's that camaraderie, it's just being professional. And I think that maybe the industry as a whole needs to weed out some of the agents who are kind of in it with kill, 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 then just understanding, you know, we all have the same goal here. And I think that's, it's a, it's an interesting mes message that's been brought up numerous times, especially with today's agent. Um, we're kind of running out of time, but I do want to ask you, I mean, you're, you're extremely knowledgeable, extremely experienced. What, what advice, what's the number one advice that you would give an agent now knowing that people really have to step up their game in this new real estate era where buyers and sellers, they can go online. You know, there is the question that I've always been asked, well, why do I need a real estate agent? So it's important for agents to know that you need to bring up your level that much more. So what do you think is different? And what's the number one piece of advice that you would give someone who wants to get into real estate today? You have to know what you offer that's different than a website. And I think most realtors don't because they still think that they are the purveyor of houses, bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage. That's all gone. We don't own that anymore. We don't even own price anymore because the buyer who calls and says, how much is it already knows. Mm -hmm. So you've got to define the value proposition you're going to bring to the table. So I can tell that consumer that says, why am I hiring a realtor? I'll say, because I'm going to help you navigate the minefield of real estate. And you might get blown up and I might get blown up, but pieces of us are going to get across the finish line together. And my consumers say, what do you mean the minefield? I'm like, because it's a hot mess. Mm -hmm. You might be smooth sailing. You might be the easiest transaction on the planet. You might also have mold in the crawl space and termites and appraisal issues and a survey encroachment and your buyer's husband died in the middle of the transaction. We don't know what's going to come across your plate, but I'm going to help you navigate when we hit a mine so we can get you to the finish line. And that's what I think most realtors don't know. They don't know how to define it. Right. Because they don't know all the things that are going to happen. Yeah, none of us do. That's why it's minefield. If we knew where everything was, you could walk through it easily. But it doesn't happen. The most experienced agents are the ones that say, I don't know what we're going to see on your transaction. Let's find out together. And the other thing you can do as you're learning the business Preview, preview, preview. And new agents are pretty good about previewing. And I say less than six months as a new agent. Because once agents hit that six month mark, you got this. Don't need anything <laughs> anymore. I'm, I am professional and experienced. And they quit learning and they quit educating themselves until they get to about the five year mark. And then they say, holy crap, I was doing real estate all this time and I didn't know what I was doing. 
because there is a reality moment that hits after you get past that initial blush of ego. Mm -hmm. So the best agents don't stop learning. They go to classes above and beyond CE. They go to every conference they can get their fanny to, and they preview, preview, preview. I sell more houses and all but about four people in Charlotte. I preview every single week because I have to know the inventory. I have to know what's out there. Is it overpriced? Is there a cool new feature that's starting to hit the market? Am I gonna start to spot a trend? You can't do any of that spotting if you're sitting on your computer, clicking through the MLS, looking at houses, because that's not previewing. Previewing is you out with your super key, making appointments and viewing houses and being visible, being involved, being active in the industry. Lee, you're truly a game changer in this business. Thank you so much for being here. Make sure to find Lee on all forms of social, check out her Facebook, and thanks so much for tuning in to Sam Speaks. Make sure to tune in to samspeaks.com, and we will see you soon.